What is life? A mysterious force? Or as many scientists assert, simply another process of matter? And why did the question so perplex the Nobel Prize physicist, Erwin Schrodinger? Before the days of Charles Darwin, biologists such as Carl Linnaeus were natural theologians. They marveled at the grandeur of God and the fantastic complexity of plants and animals. For example, in 1802, the Reverend William Paley asked, what if while walking across the field you spot a pocket watch laying on the ground? Would you ever imagine that the watch was created by the same forces that created a rock? Of course not, Paley said. That's ridiculous. You would know immediately that the watch was designed by intelligence. So what about living things, which are immeasurably more complex? Isn't that proof that they are also designed? Today, most scientists, as a matter of principle, reject the existence of mysterious, divine, or supernatural forces. Paley's argument is given the big yawn. They point to a mountain of evidence that life has evolved from simpler forms. Can't Darwin's theory of natural selection, coupled with random changes in DNA, fully explain life's evolution? And hasn't science fully demonstrated that cells are simply complex chemistry? Should anyone have any doubts? Before we get in, pulled into this argument, let's stop for a second. Is something missing? Both Paley's proponents and modern scientists focus on life's structures. They talk about things like the complexity of cells or DNA. These things can be described with a diagram or a model. They are three-dimensional forms. We tend to think of structures as static things like a photograph. They are in essence timeless. But the important aspect of life is not its structures, but its motion. A photo does not describe motion. We need a movie to explain motion. And life is an immense three-dimensional movie of unfolding forms. Life directs a spider through each step of its life cycle, from birth to death. In cells, it is the motion that creates the structures that house it. It is millions of synchronized simultaneous reactions that construct cells, membranes, and machinery. From an egg cell it is an ever-expanding patterns of molecular currents that grow into trillions of cells of innumerable organs. Life's fluid, highly controlled change of form is what separates the living from the non-living and makes life so truly four-dimensional. And exactly what directs this motion? Can the known forces of physics explain life's ever-expanding organization? Isn't this the key question? The great Nobel Prize physicist Erwin Schrödinger was so baffled by this question that he delivered a series of lectures on it at Trinity College in Dublin. Bound as the book What is Life, they are a claim for Schrödinger's proposal that DNA holds the information of life. In this line, Watson and Crick credited the book for inspiring their quest to discover DNA's structure. But the bigger question, Schrodinger's total bafflement at life's ever-organized motion, remains unanswered. Imagine a white blood cell chasing bacteria as portrayed in this animation of Drew Barry. Inside the cell, thousands of metabolic processes are intimately synchronized like the gears of a fantastic clock. We zoom into receptor molecules at the cell's surface. We see life's organized activity never stops. As a physicist, this made no sense to Schrodinger. What sustains life's perpetual fluid organization, he wondered. One can point out that the book was written in 1943. Was Schrodinger baffled because he lacked today's knowledge of molecular mechanics? Or has his question simply been ignored? Schrodinger started with the physicist's view that in general, the universe moves from complex structures to simpler, more disorganized structures of lower energy. This FIMEX simulation illustrates the point. As the tower collapses, the planks lose their organization. They also lose their stored potential energy. The planks slightly heat the ground as they hit it. All this seems a very normal progression of events. But why? Physicists give a simple statistical reason for the collapse. The tower is just one way to arrange the planks. But disorder represents innumerable ways to arrange the planks. States of disorder and lower energy are immensely more numerous. 
so the planks are simply falling to a more probable state. The measure of this disorder is called entropy. Overall, the universe keeps moving towards greater entropy and greater disorder. This is the second law of thermodynamics. A living organism is like the standing Planck Tower. It contains great order and a lot of stored energy. For example, plants are constructed of cellulose fibers made of chains of tens of thousands of highly organized atoms. But once a plant starts to react with oxygen, it quickly breaks down into tiny carbon dioxide and water molecules. Flames appear as energy is released. Like the planks of the falling tower, the molecules lose their organization and stored energy. Why does this, this occur? Again, because the total possible states of disorder and dispersed energy are immensely more numerous and hence more probable. How then does life not only escape the universal tendency towards disorder, but dramatically reverse it? Should we watch a pile of planks suddenly organize into a tower, we know immediately that something weird is going on. But it, is the organization of planks into a tower really so different from the organization of atoms and molecules into the form of a growing tree? Suppose we see the air's molecules spontaneously form a plant. There's a burst of flame as energy from the environment rushes in. Impossible? Not according to physicists. Simply so very, very unlikely, we will never see it. Unlikely, yet plants do this all the time. Life makes the improbable so probable that it becomes certainty. We expect it. But exactly how does this happen? We know a pine seed contains DNA in a lot of molecular machines. From these small DNA strands, trillions upon trillions of tiny molecules of carbon dioxide and water become organized into enormous towers that soar hundreds of feet into the air. Atoms assemble to form huge branches. They assemble into needles containing amazing photosynthetic factories that capture the sun's energy and manufacture the tree's building material. Biology textbooks acknowledge that life's organization might seem mysterious, but they offer several explanations. First, when life creates organization, it uses energy. The result? The environment becomes more disorderly. Therefore, the total entropy of the universe still increases in accord with the second law of thermodynamics. But does this really explain much? For example, suppose I arrange dominoes as a snake. My muscle cells use energy to create the order. To get the energy from food, in the process, the food's complex molecules are broken down into waste. The universe's total entropy increases. But so what? With the same energy, I can arrange the dominoes as a star, a cell, lines, as a tower. The increase in entropy in the environment does not explain the creation of the form. It does not explain what actually directs the motion of the dominoes, or life's molecules, does it? What then is the answer? The Cassiopeia Project's educational video presents the popular theory that life arose from chance molecular events and the DNA became the great organizer. The DNA molecule encodes not only the information necessary to make copies of itself, but the information necessary to construct an entire organism. blueprints for an ant, or a dolphin, or a bullfrog, or even a person. All of this information is somehow built into the structure of an organism's DNA in a molecular code billions of letters long. How then might DNA direct molecules to form a living creature's fluid, ever-changing body? Let's start with force. Nothing changes its motion unless it's forced to. This is Newton's first law of motion. Like these beads, atoms and molecules don't change their motion on their own. If they're sitting still, that's what they'll keep doing. And if they're moving in a specific direction, that's what they'll continue to do until a force comes along to direct them elsewhere. As I tap the cardboard, these beads will just bounce against each other randomly unless forced into organization. They must be coerced. As of today, science only recognizes four forces in the universe. 
The first two, the strong force and the weak nuclear forces, act in the micro realm of subatomic particles. They don't direct molecular motion. Next, gravity is the big pull that organizes stars and planets. But between atoms, it is so weak, we can forget it. So that leaves us with just one force to explain life's molecular motion. And that's the electromagnetic force. It's a mighty important one. It's light energy. It's the electric force. It's the magnetic force. And it is the force by which we understand molecular interactions. So now, let's go to the molecular realm and see how things work. Let's enlarge atoms by 10 million times, so they're one millimeter across, with the size of small peppercorns. Real atoms are clouds of electromagnetic force defined by Schrodinger's equation. But this is the same force that holds a refrigerator magnet to the door or the static cling of clothes in a dryer. There's nothing spooky about it. And living organisms are constructed of an immense number of these minute, interacting electromagnetic balls. So now we have a very clear question. With the electromagnetic force, how does DNA direct atoms into the fluid structures of a living creature? DNA strands are far too small for us to actually watch them in action. But DNA has been extensively studied, and we can watch very realistic simulations of DNA through the animation of Drew Barry. The New York Times called him the Steven Spielberg of molecular animation. Each little bump on the strand is an atom of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, or nitrogen. The chromosome is composed of two strands of DNA that bind to each other, like the teeth of a magnetic zipper. Each tooth is one DNA unit, or nucleotide. Genes are patterns of nucleotides on the DNA strand. These patterns carry the designs for the cell's machines. Let's follow the process. RNA polymerase copies the gene's pattern of nucleotides as a new strand called mRNA, seen in yellow. Tiny yellow RNA nucleotides fly into place. We are watching a very simplified model. In a real cell, DNA is in massive coils that float in a thick soup of innumerable other molecular processes. The mRNA strand floats out of a tiny hole in the nucleus. Now, manufacture of a new machine will begin. Two halves of a ribosome clamps down on the strand. Yellow triangles are tRNAs. They bring amino acids to be assembled on the ribosome. Thousands of atoms, tiny magnetic balls, are organized to become the cell's molecular machines, such as these RNA polymerases, ribosomes, or hemoglobin. But from what we see, DNA does not appear to be the director of this great drama. It is really quite passive. It is a strand that is acted upon by the machinery of the cell. Yet, something must organize the innumerable swarms of molecules floating through the cell's waters. Amino acids, nucleotides, tRNAs, mRNAs, to name a tiny fraction, swarm about without interfering. Streams of millions of molecules are synchronized as an incredible factory. It's like a vast network of invisible cages channel the movement of every molecule and strand within the cell's fluid interior. And in the growth of an organism, this rigid organization in space and time expands astronomically to create trillions of such cells with their ever dancing interiors. The protein strand, seen as red, emerges from the ribosome. Completed, it will curl about itself into a lump with a very specific shape. Then a number of these protein and RNA lumps lock onto each other to form a new molecular machine. More pieces are added. Completed, the protein sculptures march into their proper locations. From metabolic machines to membrane portals, this is how the cell's mechanisms are made. The processes operate with clock-like precision. The chromosome's replication is especially complicated. One of the paired DNA strands faces backwards relative to the other. One strand is directly copied, but the other strand must be copied in long looping sections as shown in the animation. The strands are immensely long. A large human chromosome contains up to 250 million nucleotide pairs. In our model of 10 million magnification, 
This single DNA strand would stretch more than 850 kilometers. It would stretch the length of France from top to bottom. The DNA strands spiral about each other and are densely coiled in the nucleus. Yet as the cell divides, these immense strands pass through each other to become perfectly disentangled. Dazzling organization occurs at every level. Each chromosome is many thousands of times longer than the nucleus. It is tightly coiled. Tiny histone molecules seen in blue attached to the chromosome and the DNA spools around them. With beautiful organization, the little spools pack tightly and the spiral coils become supercoiled, like a huge serpent. Again, we see how life's ever-changing organization over space and time is truly four-dimensional. It cannot be captured in a snapshot. It is a never-flowing movie, a four-dimensional movie. Zooming out, we see an actual microscopic view of the chromosomes, dense masses, as they separate for the cell to divide. Two cells. A human has 100 trillion. How complex is our body? A single chromosome sits in our hand at 10 million magnification. Two centimeters around, it stretches the length of France. Take the 46 chromosomes of one human cell, and they would reach halfway around the world. And the cell that holds these immense strands? Composed of peppercorn atoms, a typical cell is the size of an enormous skyscraper. Try to imagine it filled with the streaming molecules we just viewed. Tiny food and oxygen molecules are pulled through the membrane. Food is chopped for energy. In its nucleus, immense coils of DNA loosen and genes are copied. Molecular machines are made. Every molecule streams to its proper location in the fluid interior. Reach out and touch the cell's immense rippling surface. This is just one cell, one immense molecular timepiece. Now look out into the distance. Imagine the skyscraper cell doubling itself over and over to fill the horizon and the earth beneath with millions of such skyscraper cells as an egg cell grows into an embryo. The embryo becomes the collective beat of trillions of tiny clock cells of the evolving heart, stomach, liver, brain, skin, bone, muscles, and other tissues of the body. Fully grown in this scale, an adult human would stand twice the height of the earth. The enormous skyscraper cells stack atop each other, down through the center. They form huge tubes of veins pulsing with blood and twist through the core of the earth into thousands of kilometers of organs and skeletal cells. 100 trillion skyscraper cells, each humming with millions of molecular clocks intimately synchronized with each other. Now imagine the complexity of a whale, should it be magnified by 10 million times. Its body contains 10 quadrillion clock cells ticking in perfect harmony. 10 quadrillion sets of chromosomes. The great blue whale is built of skyscraper cells so immense its body would stretch from the earth to the moon. Or consider the growth of a sequoia tree. One set of chromosomes becomes a mass of unbelievable size. Enlarged by 10 million times, tiny water and CO2 molecules assemble into a tower that is 100 times the height of the Earth and spans the diameter of the Sun. What directs this organization? Nearly 400 years ago, René Descartes proposed a theory that life is just another process of matter. This has become the bedrock of scientific theory. Many of life's individual molecular processes can be reproduced in a test tube. But left to themselves, all test tube reactions go to equilibrium and timeless rest. Science explains the cause of life's ever-expanding com complexity with the theory of emergence. The professor Ernst Mayer, viewed as one of the greatest influences on biology since Charles Darwin, explains how the phenomena of mind and life emerge from the complex interactions of non-living matter. Putting things together in order to fully understand the system. And as soon as we do that, we get into the business of the interaction of these units. And it is the interaction that is the thing that is hard to study, hard to explore, hard to determine. And yet, it is these interactions that are 
the crucial thing about the working of systems. And this begins at the very lowest level. It goes back to the time of Darwin's friend T. H. Huxley. He was asked whether one could determine what water is by taking it apart. And he said, no, you cannot. You take it apart and you get one gas and it's called oxygen and you get another gas that's hydrogen and if you have these two gases you don't have water. You still don't know what water is. It's the interaction between oxygen and hydrogen and very particular interactions that make for water. And when some thing, some new property emerges like the liquidness of water or as Huxley called it, the aquosity of water. When that emerges, when you put things together, that is called emergence. And this is one of the big battles in, in philosophy of science and in evolution and in, in biology in general and, and in particular, that emergence is an extremely common phenomenon. You find it in any complex system and yet to study emergence and determine what makes the new characteristics emerge, those studies are, for the most part, very much at the beginning. The theory of emergence is so rooted in scientific doctrine that it is often taken as unshakable fact, even though Mayer admits its actual mechanisms are poorly understood. Mayer uses the analogy of water to explain how increasing complexity changes matter's behavior. Sure, water has a very different nature from the hydrogen and oxygen from which it is formed. But does this analogy hold water, so to speak? Air overlooks the fact that water by itself still moves to lower energy states and greater entropy. It abides by the same laws of thermodynamics as hydrogen and oxygen. The ocean waves do not dance on their own. They are driven by the external force of the wind. Water molecules do not spontaneously organize to crawl uphill. Only life does this. Only when water enters the living organism does it suddenly gain an internal organizing force. This motion suddenly becomes highly organized. How then does life make the laws of thermodynamics turn upside down? The true test of a theory is whether one can take pen to paper to diagram exactly what is going on. Can we find the answer in the operation of a machine? Well, man-made machines do not build themselves. They are assembled by external forces. And second, a machine's forces of operation must be channeled through a rigid structure, as shown in these Fimex animations. Give these machines fluid limbs and they would collapse in a motionless pile. Or take the operation of a clock. It is easy to diagram how a watch's gears sustain their synchronized motion. Again, forces are directed through a rigid structure. The gears must be aligned and held in a rigid frame. But should we remove the rigidity, the gears disengage, force is not transferred, and the gears become motionless in equilibrium. Or take a computer. Again, it is easy to diagram how it operates. The electrical forces must be channeled. Take away the rigid walls of insulators, and the electrons will immediately rush out and find equilibrium computer will die, function no more, enter a state of timelessness. Same with an engine. Solid walls and gears are required to direct the force of combustion gases to propel the car. In all machines, a rigid structure is needed to channel the forces of operation. This Fimex animation of fluid flow illustrates the point. Remove the walls and the force of the fluid immediately flows to rest in equilibrium. Like the collapsing Planck Tower, we find the disorganization of forces to be immensely more probable. They do not spontaneously organize. We see this when organized currents of color dissipate in the water. The plumes of color collide with each other, other water molecules and quickly lose their directed motion. Get in a living cell, the exact opposite occurs. A cell is full of water. Yet the cell's fluid currents of molecules remain perpetually organized. There is no tendency towards disorder, and as an organism grows, the cell's fluid currents branch into ever-expanding complexity of innumerable metabolic systems. Their organization in time and space does not decay. Rather, 
to the directed motion grows astronomically. The currents build the cell walls that house them. They act as though they are contained by a rigid physical structure, but there is none. So, despite the great appeal of the theory of emergence, if we look at life as simply a collection of so many electromagnetic balls, one simply cannot diagram a mechanism by which the balls sustain the ever-moving four-dimensional dynamic of life, much less grow it by trillions of times. This was Erwin Schrodinger's conclusion. Outside of life, the natural tendency is for complexity to fall apart. And in life, the exact opposite occurs. The natural tendency is for complexity to increase astronomically. Something very strange is occurring. Life directs the motion to matter. It can endlessly expand its organized dynamic. One tiny bacterial clock cell organizes the anarchy of tiny sugar molecules surrounding it into the intricate clockwork of billions of bacterial clock cells. Given sufficient sugar molecules to organize, there is no limit to its growth. But we see a watch spontaneously assemble from pieces in the environment. It would be quite an incredible sight. The pieces of the watch floated in water and were made of tiny electromagnetic balls. Would that change things? Would the watch be able to continuously organize the matter around it to form a mass a trillion times bigger? No. A watch is created by external forces. For many purposes, there is no need to ask the question of why life is so mechanical. And there are those who are quick to dismiss any profound significance to life's astronomic complexity. The mechanistic view has led to profound discoveries in medicine and biotechnology. And there are those, such as the late Ernst Mayer, who insist that science is objective and, in the same breath, rule out mysterious, vital, or supernatural forces. Science has to be objective, it does not accept supernatural forces, uh, and so on. But science changes. Physicists once condemned Einstein's theory of relativity, for they said it invoked an unprovable occult fourth dimension of time. Today, physics has moved into the bizarre realm of quantum physics, where the physical world is no more than a state of probability, and time and space have merged into strange multidimensional fields of black holes and string theory. But biologists still try to explain life simply from the interactions of individual atoms and molecules. This basis of biological theory has not changed significantly in 400 years. Could life's molecules be organized by an external field? A magnetic field below this sheet readily organizes all the iron particles within its influence. They swoop into the field to become aligned with it. The field gives them form. And so long as the field moves, the particles move. There are strong parallels to life's molecular motion. As with, with life, many separate particles become simultaneously organized and attracted to the growing form. We see regulation in the size and shape of the form. We see particles rise against the force of gravity to higher energy states. We see the cause of unceasing directed motion. Does not life's perpetually organized motion suggest that it is likewise directed by an external field? Might a vast network of such fields direct the organization of molecules to grow into an organism? And might such external fields even contain a creature's instinctive memory and direct its behaviors? Life is the motion of matter. Life's molecular motion is organized with gearwork precision. It keeps time like a fantastically intricate clock. As the interlocking of tiny gears, the body's myriad of molecular processes are intimately synchronized. Within cells, invisible microtubes appear to direct the fluid currents of molecules into ever-expanding organization. This vast network of invisible structures provides the design of cells, organs, and the body. In this way, life organizes the material form that house it. Is there another explanation for life's ever-expanding structures? DNA gives us no clue. And simple particle interactions provide no tangible, pen-to-paper explanation for life's ever-increasing organization. Rather, life's motion has all the character of being directed by a rigid external structure. What 
is this unacknowledged organizing field? Is it a force of intelligence and conscious creation? Do we find evidence of this force in the operation of the human mind, perception, and memory? These questions are all beyond the scope of this video, but it is not hard to follow a logical chain to reach a conclusion. For those who are interested in this journey, the book Mind Memory Time looks at the profound mysteries that science has ignored. A vast new dimension of human understanding remains to be explored. Where might that take us?